once it happens. Good afternoon. This is Martha DiVittorio, local history librarian at the Belmore Memorial Library, and with me is... Regina Feeney, librarian and archivist at the Freeport Memorial Library. Today we're going to tell you about resources available at your public library for residential genealogy, which I think is a term we coined this afternoon. <laughs> so we, at first we want to just mention that we are uh, practicing social distancing. Yes. I, in my zombie apocalypse bunker in Freeport, otherwise known as the basement. And Martha, I hear you're on David Geffen's yacht. I am indeed, and it is wonderful out here. Thank goodness I was stuck here, so. Uh, yes, it's good to have good have friends. <laughs> All right, so anyway, we're gonna do a little presentation today on how to do some research on your house. And of course, and so we're gonna also talk about some questions that we've gotten in the past right. about this. If I could get my computer to advance. Okay, let's talk about some important dates. And these are things you need to know when, when you're learning about your house and your community. One of the questions I get all the time is, I live in Freeport, and why am I not in the Freeport School District? There's part of Freeport that's in the Roosevelt School District and part of Freeport that's in the Baldwin School District. And that has to do with the fact that the school districts here were established around 1812. Freeport probably came online about 1820. So Freeport doesn't become Freeport until the 1830s and we're not incorporated until the 1890s. So basically Freeport is, um, the, the, the school districts predate the towns. And so the boundaries have expanded um, throughout the years. And Another, you live, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, if you live in Belmore, um, things are really crazy. Uh, you know now that there are four separate, you know, Belmore, North Belmore, Merrick, North Merrick. Now you have the Belmore Merrick Central High School District. So that's all crazy and zoning is nuts. But um, initially, before the first high school was built in Belmore, which I believe was 1935, Belmore residents, teens, had a choice. You had to choose between Freeport and Hempstead to go to high school. So um, things are not always straightforward or they're certainly not the way they are today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Another important date is when the railroad uh, comes to the, the South Shore. Um, originally, the, the first railroad that came out to this area is around 1839, and that was in the, in the village of Hempstead. So, before, so once that comes through, um, people in Freeport and, and Belmore and along the South Shore, they had to take a stagecoach to Hempstead to get on that train. It's not going to be until 1867 when the South Side Railroad comes, comes our way. And this is a real game changer for us because these, these communities here on the South Shore are quite isolated and the railroad starts bringing in new people and we start to begin the development of these, these communities as resorts. Right. And is that the same for you in Belmore? Absolutely. This was where you went to catch a little bit of country air, maybe shoot some game. It was not a place you thought of uh, living. Mm -hmm. Farms, um, fishing, but um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Right, right. Um, and I always like to say Freeport was the Hamptons before the Hamptons. And yeah. that, yes, and this is where people people did come. And that that changes even later on when uh, around 1910 is when the, the, the tunnel is actually open between Manhattan and Long Island. So that brings even more people out. Um, but another important date is the, the establishment of uh, Greenfield Cemetery in, in 1870. And this is an important date because before then, you had different types of cemeteries. So you had association cemeteries, you had church cemeteries, and sometimes you just got buried on the, your own property. Right, you and, had a family plot. Exactly. And the problem with that is, especially things like association cemeteries, where you were responsible for taking care of your own grave, which becomes really difficult once you're dead. So a lot of these, <laughs> a lot of these cemeteries um, became unsightly, they became eyesores, and there was a lot of vandalism. And so once Greenfield is established, a lot of families began to disinter and remove their relatives to Greenfield. And then what then happens is, is those that are left, it, they, these cemeteries become, um, they're actually condemned. And this is not something where they just move bodies willy-nilly. This actually had to go through the, 
up to the state uh, government. And the governor would have to sign off on these, these uh, disinterments. And if you go to Greenfield today, you are going to see tombstones from the 1700s. And it wasn't just they were very lucky to get buried there in this area that became a cemetery. They were moved. And a lot of that moving was done by um, Stewart of Garden City as he started to lay out streets and mm -hmm. develop Garden City and different areas. They had all these cemeteries and they were, they were condemned and then eventually moved. And if you, you want to see an example of a family plot, you can always go to the Baldwin Southard Cemetery in Belmore, which tends to look like an eyesore and it's, it's unclear as to who is responsible for mm -hmm. its upkeep. But we did have a dedicated group of Eagle Scouts years back who cleaned it up and um, discovered uh, the oldest grave and sort of publicized and people do sometimes go and walk through there and sit there, but it, it is not very nice. So I think, uh, Regina, your point is well taken. Right, right. Um, and just so you know, in the, the Freeport Cemetery that we had, we do have the disinterment records um, for, for a part of that cemetery. And all the bodies were removed. Um, though I, I did read an article when they started putting the, 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 sewer, the sewer lines in and the water lines in, they did find a couple of bones, but otherwise I haven't heard anything else. About no poltergeist scenario? Oh, no, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> no poltergeist. Um, 1899 is when Nassau County gets established. So before then, we were part of Queens County, which is good to know because a lot of our records are not necessarily going to be in Nassau County. So if you're looking at census records, you will see your town and you'll see, you know, Queens County. Just remember, Nassau County is, is a newer county. Um, the other thing, uh, another important date here is 1911. And this is, um, the village of Hem Hempstead starts to install sewers. And you think of like, well, why is that important? Well, I often get questions from people whose um, backyard, backyards have a, a, a sinkhole. Um, and that's because these are the old cesspools that are collapsing. And Actually, in my backyard, I do have a divot, and I do believe that's probably an old cesspool. But people need to understand that this infrastructure, um, I know in Freeport, started around 1920s into the 1930s. When we started putting these sewer lines in. And this was a really, really big deal when this happened. And just so you know, when, when we start to do streets, and you know, you might have a street that means it's like horrible, it's like the surface of the moon. In Freeport, they don't just come in and they just repave it. They actually dig it all up and change all those pipes. And the reason for that is because those pipes are 100 years old. So they, they, do, um, they do need to be changed out. 1925 is, the, is the, uh, the formation of the Nassau County Police Department. So in Freeport, we had our own Freeport police. I think in Belmore, you were probably under the sheriff of Nassau I County. Probably, I, I believe so. Mm -hmm. And so, so this is this was an issue, and it's not. I don't think it's a coincidence that that the, this police department is formed in the middle of prohibition, because at that time, <laughs> any of us living on the South Shore, these were the biggest um, places where alcohol was being um, brought in and brought and bring, brought to the city. So those local the local police forces could not handle this. So. Um, so Nassau County gets gets formed about 19, formed in 1925. Now, and in both yeah, Freeport and Belmore, there are homes with tunnels where rum runners would bring in alcohol. Uh -huh. So it's kind of a cool but unspoken part of our shared history. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because a lot of people never wanted to talk about it. it yeah. they, they didn't want to admit the fact that their their family was doing this stuff. I mean, now now they everyone thinks it's really cool. Um, let me just say this. There's a lot of money in vice, and uh, people made a lot of money bringing booze in. <laughs> uh, 1928 is when the first stretch of Sunrise, Sunrise Highway is developed, and, and this is an important date because a lot of people, when they look at our older maps, get really confused because we know Sunrise Highway is a point of reference, and it right. doesn't exist. Right. And, exactly. yeah, and you have, yeah, and you have something in Belmore about the opening of Sunrise Highway, right? We do, actually. We have in the grand opening of Sunrise Highway. Um, there was a parade, and apparently, the Merrymakers of Belmore, which was a club that got together for uh, lots of fun times, <laughs> won a silver cup 
for the best decorated float. And we have this beautiful ornate silver cup. So when our doors open, um, you can come in, you can make an appointment and come and see it. Uh, but we also, we, we wanted to mention also about the names is that you will see on old maps, you'll see Pipeline Boulevard, um, you'll see Conduit, actually, Conduit Boulevard in Queens is still called Conduit because it was a conduit for the water. And um, it's still called Conduit Boulevard in Queens. So Sunrise Highway was different names all across. Right. And finally, they named it Sunrise Highway. And this was a big push towards the development of Long Island as a bedroom uh, community for folks who worked in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and what happened is when they developed... They developed Sunrise Highway. They basically um, overtook all of the these little tiny roads, and then they basically followed the route of the pipes that right. were part of the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Water Work system. So, you know, Sunrise Highway isn't straight. You you'll notice that there's lots of curves in it, and that's because because they're following the pipes. And if you go if you go under Sunrise Highway, there are these huge water pipes um, under there, and those pipes were used as emergency backup water to Brooklyn. Um, until about 1977. Um, so they are still there. All right. Okay. So why don't we talk about some typical questions we get from our patrons? Right. I mean, I, I think the most, well, first of all, the most common one is I've just moved and um, my house is old. So I think it might be historically significant and nine times out of 10, I'm so sorry, but it's not. <laughs> it's not there's yeah, not that a lot of right. It's not landmarkable. You know, everybody immediately thinks, oh, they... and the other thing is also, um, and I believe it's haunted. I get that. We get that question all the time. I'm joking. Um, so they want to begin to re research the house, who lived in it. Um, who died couples, in it. Who died in it. More importantly, exactly. Am I, am I on a burial site? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then you had mentioned earlier, right, about the sinkhole. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, people, people something, they, th weird things happen. They're like, Wait, what, what's going on? And, uh, or why did my basement flood? And we'll talk about that in a minute. But I can, I can actually, I think 90% of the questions I get about houses are people think that their house is haunted. Yeah. And I, I, can, I can sort of um, relate to that because I grew up in a house that had an issue. And our little, our little ghost was really into like moving furniture, which, which was nice, but not very helpful. I mean, you know, if you want to be helpful, like, you know, fold the laundry, you know, that, <laughs> right. I mean, that's what I would do. If I was a ghost stuck in a house, I would, I would clean for you. I'd make your bed, Aww. you know, I don't want to be a good ghost. So what, there's another thing that we talk about is like what structures might've existed on the property. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but there's sometimes people are like questioning, you know, what was on this property? Um, we've had, I know in Freeport, people have dug up their backyards to put pools in and they found uh, um, trolley tracks that the trolleys used to run behind the houses. And I think you also mentioned the urban legends and I, I get that all the time. I get like, always get, everyone thinks that Mae West lived in their house and Mae West never heard of Freeport. <laughs> well, that's that's exactly. I mean, you know, when people you hear people talk about uh, past lives, like everybody was a Napoleon or a Cleopatra. You know, you might just have been a street sweeper. So that's yeah. the same thing with the houses. You know, your your house may be beautiful and it may be built in a particular style, but we may not be able to find um, uh, something historically significant. But it's, it's still your beautiful it, home. It, it's worth a try. It's Absolutely. Worth a try. And you know what? You can make it historically significant someday. Hey, there you go. There you go. All right. So we just, we, um, um, okay. So this is, um, some other things that people ask us and believe it or not, we do get questions from, um, geologists. I don't know, Martha, if you gotten that. But I, I, I really don't. I think this is much more your library. I, I've, I actually, I'm sorry. I will correct myself. We have somebody who is doing a fish migration study mm -hmm. with the Elmore Civic Association, and they have been pouring through our old maps, and they have found um, it, they're, they're enormously useful. So uh, I, I take that back, and that's a recent development. But typically, I think these questions do go to you. Right. And that's usually when somebody wants to do a new build on a property, and I have an example of that. But um, back in the 1970s, a homeowner was doing some work on their property, and they kept finding all these... Um, like old bottles and stuff. 
and they were able to find out that that, that on their property was an old garbage dump. And, and this is very interesting. Before you had municipal sanitation, people would burn their garbage and they'd bury it. And the gentleman actually found something like 470 glass bottles, which I think collectors love that stuff. So, you know, so you never know, you'll, you'll never know. And that this one particular pa patron, um, the, one of the bottles dated back as far as 1874. And so you'll never know what's on your property until you, you start digging, literally. <laughs> Don't tell your kids. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So this presentation came about a few years ago. Um, I was approached by the Nassau County Bar Association, their real estate division, um, because there had been an article in Newsday about this home. Uh, it's, the house is called Woodbine. And they, they were, I got a, the, the reporter wanted me to do some, some research on it. And it finally got published. And the Nassau County Bar Association wanted me to talk about this one particular research project. And I was kind of like, um, yeah, I, I think that's, it's, it, it's not enough there to do a presentation. So I called out to Moth and I was like, hey Moth, you want to put something together and highlight some of um, the research that we have in our own libraries that could help um, these attorneys when they're doing property searches. And so we got together and, and we did it. Um, so we kind of retooled this program to, to bring it out to a general audience. Right. But, but this, this particular um, house was uh, John J. Randall's house. And John J. Randall was the father of Freeport. Um, he, he was born in 1847 and he was president of the Freeport Bank. Um, and he was one of the early developers in, in Freeport. And he's known as the father of Freeport. He's the guy that uh, financed the, um, the, the construction of Woodcleft Canal. And he was very, very prominent in real estate development here on Long Island and in Brooklyn. And this was his home. It was a, a high Victorian home. And the story was, and this is how um, the, this was being uh, reported or was going to be reported in Newsday, that the house got split. The house was split, but because of a divorce. And that is sort of that urban legend that John okay. Durano got a divorce from his wife and they split the house down the middle. And even the current owner, uh, who is it pictured here on, on the left, that's, that her name is Marilyn Monroe. And <laughs> she, she believed, you know, she heard this. Well, that's not true. It's really not it's true. It's an excellent story uh, though, I have to say. It's a, great, it's a great story, but we can prove that it's not true. So Marilyn Monroe's house is gorgeous. And, and I have the URL at the bottom of the page. You can, should go to the site. They have like the inside shots of the house. She is a collector of African and Afrocentric art. And you would think, how does that work in a high Victorian? It works. It is mm -hmm. so beautiful. And actually in the top floor of the house, she has this gorgeous meditation studio. So uh, definitely check that out. Um, but I was able to prove that John J. Randall never got a divorce because we actually, there is no record of him getting a divorce. And if you go to the cemetery, now as an archivist, I consider tombstones that were erected at the time of someone's death a primary document. So here we are at the, the, the Randall Miller plot in Greenfield Cemetery, and all three of John J. Randall's wives are buried in the plot with him. So definitely not, definitely not a divorce. His first two wives predeceased him, and his third wife, who was his, also his housekeeper, um, died after him. So we can, we can actually cross that off as, as an urban legend. The second question that, um, that I got from the reporter is when did the house actually get split? And so this is where we had to sort of dig into our resources for, for maps. And we knew from having spoken to John J. Randall III many years ago um, that the house he believes got split about 1920. And again, we don't like to always go by people's memories we really want some something some something hard to hard facts. And here we have two maps. And one map is the house and it's it's all of its property in 1917. And then here's another map in, from 1925, and the house is split. So John J. Randall III was right. It happened sometime around 1920. And you're probably thinking, well, why did he split the house? And it it's believed that the house was so big that John J. Randall III. I mean, John J. Randall the first didn't want the house to ever become a rooming house. And he was afraid that could happen because the, the area of Freeport was getting developed and the house was just too big for, for anyone um, to really care for it properly. So the house got split and part of the house got moved 
to West Woodbine and the other half got moved to um, East Woodbine. And this is, um, this house is actually in a development, which is very confusing for people today. It's called Randall Park. And I'm sure you have this in, in Belmore too. These residential developments were often called parks. And yes. they're not parks with playgrounds. You know, they're, they're parks of development. And so, so this, but today in Freeport, people know um, Randall Park as a Southern park which is if you on if you ever go down to Woodcliffe Canal, you're going to pass it. Um, it's between um, Guy Lombardo and South Ocean Avenue. And that there, to the, to the right, you can see a picture of the gates of going into to Randall Park. And this was property that John J. Randall willed to the village of Freeport um, um, upon his death. And it is, it is, a, it is a park. So when they say <clears throat> the park, they really meant like a zone or an area, like a historic Correct. development zone, so. Exactly, and I know. Do you do you have a lot of um, do you have a lot of um, do you, like develop? Do you, are you familiar with all the developments in 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 Belmore? Do you, do you are familiar with their names? Yeah, I know that there was there was White City, which was back in the nineteen forties, which sounds terrible, but it was actually developed by a developer whose last name was White. Mm -hmm. um, there was, I think, Belmore. I think there's a Belmore Park, which and no one uses either one of those. Um, names anymore like it's they're really not relevant anymore well you they they can be if you are looking at like in the legal notices and newspapers sometimes mm -hmm. those will pop up and you're like wait what are you talking about and people see that and they're talking about randall park and they think oh they must be talking about the Sa south freeport and i'm like no they're talking about north freeport so yeah so if you want to delve into research um here are the different types of resources that are available at various nassau county libraries you have local history collections, which um, they're kind of hit and miss. Uh, you know, some are more robust than others. Uh, my local history collection is a teeny tiny fraction of what Regina has. Um, but, you know, definitely there are items of value and there are definitely items, and I don't mean monetary value, I meant information. And there are items there that will put you on the right track and point you in the right direction to finding your answer. There are um, vertical files. This is an old library term, which is uh, basically drawers, like old filing drawers filled with clippings, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, there is Ancestry.com, which I think all of Nassau County libraries uh, subscribe to, but it is only for use at the library, except this is the pandemic edition of our presentation. So for the moment, Ancestry.com has opened up its use so that people can use it from home. And I believe they've extended that through June 30th. Is that correct? They, they did. And you do, you can't just go to Ancestry.com. You do have to go through your library's webpage because it will ask for the barcode of your library card to access it. Right. So, right. If there ever were a time to promote getting a library card, um, and I think we're going to do that a couple of times, but it really is your passport to everything. So if you go in, um, you go in through your library's website and there will be a new link, not just, you know, hey, you can only use this in-house. There's going to be, it's like a temporary um, home subscription. So you do have to go in with your library card. Then there are newspaper databases. So um, your libraries will all have uh, historic New York, New York Times from 1851 to the present and also Newsday, which started in 1940 and obviously continues to the present. Um, there are also directories and phone books, which can be enormously useful when you're trying to, for example, uh, figure out then and now. You know, in 1967, what did the main strip look like in my town? Um, so you can, you can actually go through. You can use the yellow pages, the white pages, and just a, a special note, Great Neck has a collection um, for Nassau County, New York telephone books. They have the white pages, I think. Uh, they have 1913. And then 1915 to 1976 on microfilm and uh, 77 to 2004 <clears throat> on microfiche, which is easier to use. Um, and they're in geographical arrangement. So the last available year they have is 2004. Um, but these are really, really helpful uh, for family, you know, doing research on a family, how long they lived in a town, how many, uh, how many of them were in a particular area and again for businesses that's where i really use the directories mm. and last is environmental impact studies which regina you've had uh, 
occasion. Right. Yeah. So we, so like we've had a couple of places that um, like Columbia Bronze and there was a um, NASA uniform and there's a couple of places that had some issues that had a lot of chemicals. So they, they had to do cleanups and you, and, and a lot of times uh, other locations such as dry cleaners, they've had to, you know, look at sort of uh, cleaning up that soil. So those, those uh, records are all given to you, to our library and we have them so you can check them out. Um, just one thing getting back to some of the directories, um, some of those directories are now available on Ancestry. Um, they're a little kind of hard to use, but you can find them. But one of the older directories are so cool because they do also do a street by street. So they'll, so you can go to a street and it'll tell you everyone who lived on that street. So that it's really kind of a, a really cool thing. So here is what I was talking about. This is a typical, um, you know, clipping or vertical file. And actually this, uh, the Historical Society of the Belmores created, it was like a little photo album, which is very cute, buildings and places. Um, but sadly, a lot of hometown newspapers are not digitized by their publisher and they're not archived. It's often up to the local library to keep a full run of these papers and hopefully invest uh, in the future in a costly and time consuming digitization effort. We just did it. I, I would say now it's been two years. We just got our hometown newspaper digitized and at our expense and it took a very, very long time and the community is loving it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Till you can afford or have the time to do the digitization, Clippings can be of tremendous value. So that's, that's an example, you know, 75th anniversary for the Worth House. Um, our hometown paper had a feature for many, many years where they would look back, you know, 100 years ago in Belmore, and it was really wonderful and, and the community loved it. So before it was digitized, this was the way uh, we would have clippings, in this way that we provided information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still, I still have all our old vertical files. And, you, and I'm just looking at your your 75th anniversary uh, image there. And the one crazy thing about a lot of our vertical files, there's all these undated, you know, articles. And you're like, you know, yeah. you have no idea when this was, you know, start doing the math there, what was 75th anniversary for the Worth House. But yeah, that's, what, that's one of the problems. And the other problems is, so a lot of people, and we try to fix this, they put the actual cutout newspaper into the vertical file. And over yep. time, those, those articles start to like, um, to become embrittled and, and actually turn to dust. So there are some issues with vertical files, but I, I concur. Um, it's because it's sometimes in our verticals, and more than just newspaper articles, they might have been like a brochure to something too. You know? Right. No, absolutely. We have, yeah, definitely. Um, and this, I happen to know that the Worth House was established in 1903. So I know this paper is from 1978. Oh, but good. You can do math because I wouldn't be able to do that. So that was, <laughs> well, like, oh, I haven't had my wine yet. <laughs> Um, but right. you, you'll often see um, a, a very diligent, dedicated, either local history society, a, a history historical society member or librarian, very neatly write the date of the newspaper. Yes. On the, so there's a lot of love and care that goes into typical to, uh, vertical files. And I believe the Queens Public Library, they have their big Long Island division. They do maintain vertical files on on um, all, all the town. So they're, they're still actively clipping. And I think Hofstra uh, has, I don't think they're, they might not be actively clipping, but they do maintain vertical files. Yep, they do. Okay, so before we were talking about, you know, why do you need to know about your property? And I think that knowing the history of a property makes it more marketable, right? It's, it, you know, if you can say something interesting or fascinating about, you know, that that's the original wall from the uh, fireplace of this house that was built in 1782, you know, that's, that's attractive. Um, this particular property in town, I just, it's like an orphan and it breaks my heart. So I kind of wanted to talk about it. Um, can the illustrious history of this little piece of land save this patch of real estate? This sad, empty little triangle, I don't know if you can see uh, the signs. One says Belmore Road and the other one says uh, Belmore Avenue. So to the left is Belmore Avenue, to the right is Belmore Road, and this is a little triangle of land in between. Um, and it was known as Dubert's Corner for the longest time. It has quite a history, but it has remained vacant and, and really kind of bleak looking since a fire set by arsonists destroyed the last restaurant to do business at the historic site. 
Um, first, it was handled by A.J. Finkelstein Real Estate. Then it was Greystone Properties. And most recently, um, I'm sorry, and then most recently Greystone Properties. But new setback laws, meaning how far from the street you have to have your property. New setback laws are making this triangle-shaped property really difficult to sell. Um, the last building that was there was able to extend clear across the back edge of the triangle, um, almost into the road. And now it would have to be set back quite a bit on both sides. So, you know, it's really, it's very difficult to market that. Um, mm -hmm. So let's take a look at Dubert's Corner. If, yep, back in the day, this was Dubert's Corner. You see the little triangle and there's a little buggy, I guess, coming down <laughs> south on Belmore Avenue. And um, it is misspelled, scratched into this photo, which by the way, when I was saying how diligent and lovely um, historical society members uh, can be when noting the date on an article, a newspaper article, this is something that you see all the time. They scratch the information right on the um, surface of the photograph, which makes me crazy. Mm -hmm. And I misspelled Dubert and, and that makes me nuts. So for all eternity, this is misspelled, but we're gonna talk about that later. So this is at the turn of the century, and this house was owned by John G. Dubert, who was an important figure in local politics, first in Brooklyn, and then in Nassau County. And he owned and operated a beautiful hotel right in the middle of town in Belmore. And remember, this is where people went to do some fishing, some gaming, uh, take in some country air. Um, it's right in the middle of the town of Belmore, and this 1906 map highlights this triangular plot of land that was his. And if I don't know how well you can read it, but you see J.G. Dubert right there. And that little tiny drawing is, is uh, this home. And, and I think sometimes if you can prove that there was something there originally, sometimes you can get a variance. Um, you, mean, you mean with yeah. the setback? With the setbacks. You, you know, can say like, listen, this was, this was here for forever. And, you know, there's no way it can be constructed, but we know how this is how it looked. And sometimes it, it might be worth a shot, you know, and right. that might help you. Um, yeah. you know, getting things, uh, you know, getting things changed. That's a good piece of advice. Um, so then we have uh, next in the very early 1900s, the building became a restaurant or a lodge and was known as the Smithville Cafe. And later on, it was known as the Triangle Rest. So this postcard, according to the Smithsonian Institute's guideline, they have uh, these guidelines for dating postcards um, because of the little border around it. Uh, we can tell that it dates from the uh, early 1930s. Mm -hmm. Triangle Rest, we know it was called. Smithville Cafe, we know it was called. But the Rest Inn is something that we don't really know too much about. So in our collection, we happen to have, and this is something that uh, it might have come from a clipping file or a vertical file at one point, but now we have it in uh, archival folders and you know we're trying to preserve it. This is a certificate of doing business, conducting business under the name of the Rest Inn, and it's dated from 1937. Um, and then you can see here that Frank Canetti was the owner, and the business address, which I love, no details, just Belmore Avenue and Belmore Road, North Belmore, Long Island. So it's the Rest Inn. And then lastly, we actually have a photograph of the rest in with a car that looks like it's from um, the 1930s as well. So uh, we have documented existence in our collection and we have this one digital copy of a photo with unknown provenance. So it's really, um, it's interesting. I don't know why the rest in wasn't covered. Perhaps it was only around for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. But after that, it became the Smithville Cafe again. And if you notice, you see how the this restaurant runs all the way from one end of that triangle clear across to the other end. And it made, uh, you know, we, the proprietors made everything old new again. And uh, after it was the Smithville Cafe in the 80s, it became Laura's Roadside Barbecue. And then unfortunately, it became a barbecue itself <laughs> of 2009. Um, they, they believe it was arson. It just went up in flames. And the spot has remained vacant ever since the demolition of the building, which didn't happen until 2010. So now that sad little lot that you see. Um, and just interestingly, on the next slide, we have the silhouettes of Hubert's Corner. That's the original picture. You see the house? 
Look at the rest in uh, on the top right. You can see that the silhouette of the building is the same. Um, you've got the postcard. It's the same structure, which I think is so interesting. And we use that in local history investigations, if you will, all the time. We look at the silhouette of a building to see if indeed that is um, the location that someone is asking about. Or, uh, you know, I lived a few houses down from such and such a restaurant or such and such a landmark. And then we can tell, yes, you're in the right area. So that's, I love that you can see the silhouette back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you can also tell that that road um, was actually made wider because there was actually more property. Yeah. First slide. Yeah. So the, the roadway actually is probably like a very small roadway and then they just, they expanded it. You're right. You're right. So this is something that um, I like to talk about. Uh, you know, we've been talking about research that librarians are Terriers. Anytime a librarian acquires a new piece of information in the pursuit of answering a query, it becomes part of their physical and or digital collection to be used again in future research. So over the past, you know, five, six years, I've gathered this little group of documents, maps, and images for a single location in the hamlet of Belmore. And if we're really good and we can manage to keep up to date, we scan or make digital copies of information and we add what is known as metadata to the item so it can be found again and is useful. So when I say that we have documents that were maybe in a clipping style, now they're in archival folders and we've got a big Excel spreadsheet which we're using as a database and we have um, metadata which is basically keyword information about that document. So if you need to, if you want to find out if we have that document, it's pretty easy to locate where it is. We have the box number, the folder number, and the location of the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we do the same too. Right. Um, but we one of the things uh, we are trying to do with some of these old documents is we're trying to transcribe them because what we found is a lot of young kids can't read cursive and it becomes very difficult. So we, we try to have all that stuff transcribed. And sometimes it can be really difficult depending on uh, the person's handwriting. That is such an interesting project. And I, we actually have had two assignments given to us by a, a gentleman who had an ancestor who fought in the Revolutionary War. And there are documents that are part of the National Archives and he has photocopies of them. Mm -hmm. Now they can be found on Ancestry.com. They've actually made their way onto Ancestry.com. But this soldier was asking for his soldier's pension. And it's a deposition that he underwent. And it took me months to translate it. And it was an absolute delight. It was so much fun. And we really had a good time reading through it together. So, I mean, local history research is fascinating. Right. And you can just read, if you read this document here, County of Queens. So there you go. So, there you go. Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is a draft. We, uh, one of our famous people is Thomas D. Smith. So he was a justice of the peace in the town of Hempstead, for the town of Hem Hempstead in the county of Queens. And he was also um, town supervisor. He was uh, sort of a big wig in the South Side Railroad. And then when it finally became the Long Island Railroad, he was a surveyor, he was a teacher. Um, he was just sort of a Renaissance man. He had a, a law practice. And what you're looking at is we have a lot of drafts of his correspondence. And um, then they were transcribed and written beautifully by the clerk and put into documents that ultimately went to the county. So we have the rough drafts and they're very interesting and very cool. So this letter reads um, to Thomas D. Smith, a justice of the peace, blah, 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 under uh, section 61 of article four of title one of chapter 16 of the revised statutes of the amendments. Notice is hereby given thereto that the undersigned a person liable to be assessed for highway labor in said town and residing therein applies and asks for a jury to be drawn on the second day of February, 1880, to certify as to the necessity to lay out a highway in said town, commencing at the South Oyster Bay Turnpike Road, which I think is Merrick Road, um, opposite the southerly terminus of the Little Neck Road, now called Belmore Avenue, and running from thence southerly, through the lands of James M. Seaman to the creek or landing, and from thence southerly and easterly to the south landing, which said highway will pass through the lands of James M. Seaman, um, who do not 
consent to the laying out of the same said road being of the width of three rods. So it's signed Joel Ackerley and dated January 26th of 1880. So this gentleman would like to have a big major road for the purposes of commerce run through his neighbor's land. And his neighbor's like, I don't think so. And this Seaman is his neighbor. So I never knew what happened with that request. So um, finally, I have, access, I have access to a 1906 map where uh, I see that I'm looking at the same area and I notice that the requester, Jay Ackley, is listed as a landowner below the proposed start of the road he wants, which makes sense because he wants to make sure that commerce runs right alongside his property. I see that his neighbor is, uh, in 1906, is one Adam or A. M. A. And that is a name I recognize. In a town literally named for the number of Smiths who lived there, M.A. is unusual enough to stick in my memory. Um, Belmore was called Smithville early on, and Thomas D. Smith is one of those famous Smiths. Um, so thanks to the Hempstead Town historian, I actually have a copy of a map from 1935, which lists Harry M.A. as the owner of property right alongside Belmore Canal, where his father had lived, next to J. Ackley. So the families were clearly involved. And if we look at that road, that is now known as Public Highway. You see Dock Road on the very bottom is known as Public Highway. And I remember we had a picture in our collection that referred to Belmore Harbor as Public Highway. I see that that is Adam Amay's store. So now I go and I search Google Maps, Maps for that corner and I find the Villa Daqua restaurant, um, which is the next picture. Okay. <laughs> um, the Google Maps lists there, right there, um, Villa Daqua, and it's right along Belmore Creek, and you'll see the shape is the same as on the old 1935 map. And the last picture here is of the Villa Daqua restaurant, which stands on the same spot and has kept the same profile of the building. Once again, we're looking at the silhouettes of the building, even after being rebuilt post Superstorm Sandy, which I think is really neat. Um, and, and this is all pretty cool and I never even had to leave my desk. So that's the kind of research that we get to do as local history librarians. The next thing you need to know, so we're terriers, we never forget a question. It took me five or six years to finally get the answer, but it was important to me. You also need to know that librarians are hoarders. Um, so in our collection, we have this wonderful picture of the Belmore Boys Band, and they were pretty famous in the 20s. They used to play um, at public gatherings, at parades, just to entertain folks in public squares. And um, we also have a concert, a program from a concert um, from 1920, which is part of our collection. Now, why would we hold on to that? Is that important at all? It's kind of cute, it's kind of cool, but then, I realized that people used to use the programs, if we go to the next slide, just like you would now in a yearbook, people would buy ads. And that is how you would finance it. Like you could fundraise for an organization, you could fundraise for a school, people would buy ads and local businesses would buy ads. So here is something else that I've been looking for. Your reliable tailor, Jay LaManna, what's the address? We know his phone was Wantaw 524 and he was on Bedford Avenue, but I have no idea where that store was located. And I have been dying to know because I have a really neat photograph of LaManna Taylors. That's LaManna Taylor Dry Cleaner. This is sometime in the 40s. He's standing outside his store. And if you look really closely, his poor beleaguered wife is sitting in the window. <laughs> so he would keep her in the window, you know peddling that, that uh, sewing machine for everyone to see what a hardworking family they were. All right, so now we go to Ancestry.com. And it was very common for uh, shopkeepers to live above their business. And that is precisely the situation with LaManna Taylors. When I put in Joseph LaManna, um, it's really hard to see here. It's very tiny. But I could see that he uh, lived at, I believe it's 312. Yep, 312 Bedford Avenue, and he had his entire family. There's Rosa, the wife in the window, um, and that they were business owners and they were tailors. So I know now that the LaManna Taylor shop was at 312 
Bedford Avenue, which helps me if I want to put together a map of where old businesses were. So that's kind of neat. And sometimes it's, it's a combination of looking at all different types of documents to right. figure it out. So that's, that's why kind of we save everything and we repurpose everything. So, because yep. you never know, you just never know. <laughs> okay, so we both love our libraries. We love being librarians. Um, and what we want you to know is that there are other libraries that you can join. Anybody living in New York State is eligible for library cards, city library cards. And you can apply for many of these cards online. Now, it's not that we're telling you to, to, to you know, go to someone else. But what we want to tell you is that there's other resources. And you right. might as well get as many library cards as you can. Because and we, we all have different, different resources. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, having multiple library cards. Um, and and we, don't, we don't think you're cheating on us. So that's Exa okay. Exactly. Mm -hmm. No, in fact, we encourage it. This is an enormous privilege uh, to have access to New York Public Library, Brooklyn and Queens Public Libraries. They have tremendous collections and they're a, a huge system. Right, right. They're huge systems. So, and we have access to that. Why wouldn't you? Exactly. And just in Freeport, if you live in Freeport or you own property in Freeport, you work in Freeport, um, you're, you're eligible for a library card there. And even your Same employee. Same for yeah. yeah. So I always, I always tell people like, and people say to me, well, I have a card, like somebody from Belmore might come to me and goes, well, my library card works, you know, anywhere in Nassau County. I would like to place a reserve for one of your books, but I'm going to use my Belmore card and pick up at Freeport. The problem is, is that Freeport patrons, people with our barcode have priority. So what happens is people from our town keep jumping over you. So if you have a, a Freeport library card because you work in Freeport, you might as well get one because you'll have, you'll end up getting priority on our materials. Right. Um, so I also want to talk about another incredible resource is the New York State Library. And when you go there, a lot of the databases they have will redirect you back to your public library. But if you are an attorney, a physician, or a municipal historian, you are eligible for something called a P card, which I believe stands for professional card. Yep. And so it's just another layer of databases that um, you can have access to. And again, you can apply for it online. Two of the databases that they have is something called New York's Historical Newspapers. Um, and they go back to 1733. So it's just another, another newspaper database that you have access to. And something called the Digital Sandborn Maps, which I think you at Belmore have access to, but just, just do for the moment. Just yeah. for the moment, right. Um, I actually have access to it um, through our historian because she's a municipal historian and therefore she has access to, she has a P card. So if you are something you're looking for on a, a Sanborn map, and Sanborn maps are insurance maps. And at Freeport, we actually have um, the original uh, 1917 Sanborn map. And the Freeport Historical Study has, I think, the, the prior, the earlier ones to that. Um, which is interesting because those physical maps are actually in color and the ones you have online are black and white. But if there's something you need from a sandboard, you could always, if you're from Belmore, contact Martha. Martha will contact me. I'll contact our village historian because we're going to share all this stuff. And that's true. I mean, we really do work together. Um, we're very collegial and we feel strongly about getting patrons, regardless of where they're from, information. And, uh, you know, most of the, many of the librarians, we know one another and we'll offer one another professional courtesy. And, and it's, you are linked into a great network. Just start with your home library and we will connect you. Right. Then we mentioned, I think, Regina, you mentioned the Long Island Studies Institute um, earlier. This uh, collection is on the Hofstra campus and it is open to the public by appointment of particular interest is the collection of the Nassau County Museum, which includes the very robust collection of the Nassau County Historical Society. So um, it is worth your while. If you have any interest in um, the history of your town, the history of Long Island, they also have something at Hofstra called the Suburban Studies um, Collection. So they're looking at the development of Long Island as a suburb, and it's fascinating, fascinating history. So um, it's definitely worth, you know, calling up, making an appointment and going over. It's a nice way to spend an afternoon. Yeah, and I would always suggest making an appointment. Um, you know, yeah, absolutely. Because you, yeah. I, I, I don't know if you have this, Martha, but I get, I had a person come in on a Saturday 
they drove three hours to Freeport because they're related to the Rayner family. And I'm thinking like, you wouldn't call ahead to make sure somebody was there to help you? Cause it just, it just was like, no, always call ahead, make sure there is somebody there to help you. Um, and, and in fact, that kind of might give them a chance to pull things for you. Um, That's exactly right. Right, yeah. Okay. So especially at smaller libraries like Belmore, I mean, I, there are two local history librarians, but this is one small part of many other things we do. So we may not be available. We may not be in, like Regina said, or we may not be available at the moment when you walk in. So it's always a good idea to call ahead. And then we will prepare for your arrival. Right. And, and, a lot of, and what we try to do is try to make a stuff, um, a stuff as available to the public digitally. Right. And we're working on that. That's an ongoing project. So... These image databases, there used to be something called Long Island Memories, and um, it ultimately converted into the New York Heritage Digital Collection. And I believe it used to be a hub, right, of the Digital Public Library of America. Is it still? It, um, it, I don't believe. I think they, they're not part of that. Yeah. Um, but what happened, I think there's like, so this is this whole project is sponsored by the Long Island Library Resources Council. And I believe there's something like nine councils in the state of New York. Yes. And they started it for NASA Suffolk, and they just kind of let us do that for a few years. And then all of these other library councils had been doing that locally. And they've, the last few years, I think it was, they combined them all together. So this is everybody's images and yearbooks and other ephemera that people have digitized throughout New York State. So you have the ability to search across the entire state, or you can go into a specific collection. Right. And it, it is it is tremendous. And um, when you search New York Heritage, obviously you're probably going to want to put in some. You know, let's say you're from Belmore, you're going to search Belmore. Um, there, you don't have to look at the Belmore collection. Freeport's collection has postcards and images from Belmore. Most of the South Shore, there's a lot of overlap. Mm -hmm. So kind of be loosey goosey with your searching and and cast a wide net. And I think you won't be disappointed. But this is wonderful, wonderful website. And you can learn so much. We've actually had people call the library um, to say, you know, I have a wonderful image that I think would enhance, and they'll give us the digital rights. So they'll send us a digital copy of the photograph, we'll do some research on it, and then we'll add it to our digital collection. And, so. and, I, and I know what we do is when something is donated to us, um, like a digital copy, we always put your name in the metadata. Oh, for sure. So, so you you will forever be attached to that image. So um, it's just a great way to share things. And you, you never know, um, you know, you, let's make it as, as widely available to the public as we can. So if you have some stuff, and even if you don't want to get rid of the originals, we'll just borrow your items for a, for, for a little while. We'll digitize them and we'll send them right back to you. Um, right. And, and I, I get a lot of calls too from publishers and even um, TV producers who want to use images for documentaries or, or reproductions for for, um, for 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 books or magazines? So we get a lot of that too. So um, one of the interesting things about our image databases is you you can sort of search like through time and and you learn a lot about what was what went on in your town and how certain things have changed and some things just stay the same. And here's an image of the hurricane of 1938. Um, that's casino, and that is the same angle of of that picture from Hurricane Irene. And you can see in both cases the street flooded. So um, not much has changed there. Okay, so looking in this same uh, database, if you look at Belmore. This is kind of interesting. The first image, this is the Belmore Schoolhouse, which was built right around 1888, and it's now um, a private residence. So the dormers and the brick porch and the stairs were added after 1908 when the building was sold to private owners. Um, the original entrance was on the west side. So if you look at the map, you'll see, oh, by the way, this was formerly the Stephen Baldwin estate. Um, and you will see that the school is facing Newbridge Road, and that was a huge uh, playground. So uh, the original entrance was on the west side at the left of the picture, and that's showing a south side view. So the original structure was of wooden clapboard 
with its entrance facing Newbridge, Newbridge Road rather than Orange Street, and it comprised one large room featuring seven foot windows. And the original slate chalkboard remains behind the east wall, while the school's wooden flagpole is presently located in the next house's yard and is used as a laundry pole. <laughs> um, this is a landmark, by the way, uh, of one of the landmarks in the town of Hempstead. So on the 1906 map, you see that the um, property clearly lines up with New Bridge Road, but now the house is on Orange Street, about three houses in from New Bridge Road. Um, and those other houses weren't there before. So the land that they were on was part of this huge playground, the lot that belonged to the school. So you'll see how development will change. You know, this address is now on Orange Street, but it was the New Bridge Road School. Mm. Oh. Newspapers, local newspapers. Now this is another, we talked about New York State, um, well we talked about New York historical newspapers. This is a different source than the one that we had on the other slide, right? Well no, this is, um, the other one was a, as a, was a, uh, a paid database. This is our, these are our local uh, newspapers. And, and it, again, it's kind of like New York Heritage. Um, it, it is all of New York State uh, libraries are contributing to this project. Right, and so, but they have similar names, but I don't want you to confuse them, but this is, this is an amazing project. And we just, I think I mentioned that we digitized our hometown paper, which was a labor of love and great expense and lots and lots of time. And now we can be found on this amazing database. So um, it's, it's exciting to see us there. Again, um, I kind of, if I'm really looking for a piece of information, I never limit the search to just the Belmore newspaper because the town of Belmore, going way, way back, was covered by papers in Freeport, in Brooklyn, at Rockville Center, Queens. The South Shore was kind of not fluid, but we kind of, maybe things, juicy events that were happening on the South Shore were picked up by Brooklyn and Queens newspapers. Mm -hmm announcements, all kinds of things. I and mean, that's so, because, yeah, so many people from Brooklyn came out here and summered here. So yeah. you're definitely going to find, um, you know, mention of them, and then you're going to find stuff in the Brooklyn papers about people out, out here um, on the South Shore. Right. So cast a wide net. And it might, mm -hmm. it, yes, it takes a lot to go through <laughs> these newspapers, but um, that's local history research and uh, genealogical research in general is very painstaking and meticulous. So, right. Yeah stomach for it. This is yeah. really good. We, we started digitizing, I think we were the beta testers for Nassau County, or actually I think we were the beta testers for Long Island on this project. Mm -hmm. We started digitizing our newspapers in 2005. And that, that first, we, we got a grant, and I believe that cost something like $24,000. This is not an inexpensive um, proposition. It is, it is quite expensive. Mm -hmm. And it actually took us, um, that, so the first go around, we got a grant that got, I think, nine rolls of digi uh, newspapers digitized from 1895 to 1921. And we have been following up since then. And we finally finished this project. And it took us 15 years to do, to get it all done. Wow. And we, every year, we will do the previous year's worth of, of the local newspaper, The Leader. Um, but it's, it's so worth it. And, and I, I know Rockwell Center just recently came online. Our papers went to 1921, um, and those were like the Nassau County Review, and that covered all of Nassau County. And right. then the newspaper moved to Rockwell Center, and Rockwell Center picked up on their microfilm from there on. And so, um, so all of a sudden, that donut hole we had was been filled, and that was done in the last few years. So it's amazing how much more of these resources are available. And that's what I always say to people: keep checking back because it's yes. constantly being updated, constantly being updated. And the one thing I love about the newspaper database is that in every article, it includes something called a persistent or durable link. So if you copy that link, it will always take you back to that one page. Right. So it, it's a really great, great, um, it's a really great asset. Right. If you're keeping like a Word document and you're keeping all of the resources that you found, it's those permanent links are invaluable. Yeah, exactly. And again, the, a couple of really cool things is that, you know, checking out the newspaper ads. Like, so one of the things when I get people asking me for their house, I throw in the address, right? And so this person who lives at 166 Rutland just found out that they have, they live in an old funeral home. <laughs> Congratulations. Why that's, 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 well, that's why your house is haunted. Um, and it probably means it's a gorgeous house with ample parking, but anyway. Exactly. 
The basement's a little creepy though. I don't know. Yeah, just um, a little. Just a little creepy. Um, so anyway, so, so these are some of the things that you can find. And just, you know, you have to be a little creative with um, the way you search things because sometimes they spell out words like road. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes, um, you know, they... So the, you got to be just kind of play around with it and just always keep in mind that the names of streets have changed. So yes. you keep that in mind. And here it is. Um, this is an example of that same house just turned up in a newspaper that was not a Freeport newspaper. This is the East Rockaway Limbrook Observer. Uh, and now it seems like this house was a church. So it's a very interesting, uh, you know, you, you never know where you're going to find information. So as, as Martha said, just cast a very, very wide net. I bet that's a really neat structure. Maybe we should take a field I trip. I know, maybe we should take a picture of it, right? So then there's searching by name, um, which can also be tricky, um, especially with the older newspapers in the, in the days before spell check. Remember, I already told you that Dubert was misspelled on the photograph. Um, there was a lot of variation in spelling and or just plain old typos. So let's take Dubert again as an example. Uh, it's not a common name, so you think that you'll do fine. You just put it in, D-E-U-B-E-R-T, and there you go. Um, I put Dubert in, and I actually, it's spelled several different ways in the same article. So be flexible. Um, you know, you'll find that in Ancestry.com, too, when you search. You'll find that they actually allow you to search by almost exactly, you know, is it, is it exactly the spelling, or is it kind of like the spelling? Would it sound like it? You know, it was like the Wild West in the old days. So um, you can also find uh, individual mortgages extended to individuals, often by other wealthy landowners appear. So you can, searching by a name of an individual reveals lots of activity and lots of different things. Uh, it's just very interesting. Right. And, and what, keep in mind too, is that many of our newspapers that have been digitized were taken from microfilm. And yes. for many, many years, those, those, those films were being run through a machine. So a lot of them are scratched. So when when they run these these uh, microfilm through through the computer to um, convert it to a digital file, it they they also um, convert all that text to make it machine readable. But sometimes if there's a scratch, um, it doesn't always pick up certain letters. And sometimes if they use weird fonts in a newspaper, the the computer can't always read it. So definitely take your time with it. And even if the word is spelt right, the computer may not have realized the spelling has an incorrect spelling. And that is why those durable links are so important because you might even have a copy of the article right in front of you, but you're putting in the title and it's not coming up. It's just because the, the, the way the, when it was converted, it's just not reading it properly. But the neat thing too is that uh, ads, the names do come up in ads and that's really, really fantastic. Yeah, you can get a lot of, lot of find a lot of great stuff. Yep. All right, so we're going to share with you a couple of tricks of the trade. The first of which is, please look beyond page one of your Google results. Um, there is some incredible stuff that can be found uh, beyond the first 10 results. You know, maybe the top three are even sponsored. Um, books is actually wonderful. Um, and I want, you know, I, I wanted to know who the proprietor of the Worth Hotel in Belmore was, which we saw in the clippings file slide. So I wanted to know who the proprietor was uh, at the turn of the century. So I tossed the terms Worth House and Belmore into Google, and I found this lovely guide issued by the Long Island Railroad. Uh, and these were very common. They were trying to encourage travel to the country. So they would tell you things like um, uh, how many miles it was from New York City, how often, how many trains ran each day, um, and a couple of hotels in the area. So guess who? It was um, John G. Dubert's son, Edward. And I swear to you, I didn't know that before I did that Google search. Um, Dubert, I'm, I must be haunted by Dubert. Uh, his son, Edward, was running the show and John Dubert died, J.G. Dubert died at the Worth Hotel. So wow. kind of interesting. Wow, yeah, those, those are great. And I actually, um, some of the stuff I did in my collection was to go through through Google Books and just try to put Freeport in, Freeport, New York, Freeport, Lib uh, Freeport, Long Island, and see what books mention Freeport. And then I was able to go in and say, oh, okay, this is good to know. Like, or, you know, should I purchase this book for our collection? So right. there's, there's some great stuff. Um, 
you know? Yeah, and there's a lot of like tax records. So yeah. you can find out if you're unsure of the name of a hotel, like you're pretty sure that hotel was in your town, you know, they have to, um, they, they have to register. And so you would see, and so it's so funny because sometimes the addresses are like, uh, you know, Belmore, like no street, they're just right. so, so well known they won't give a street exactly because everybody knew that. and just keep in mind i know in freeport we didn't start using um uh street address numbers until i think about 1908 oh um, yeah and, that, okay. and that's when they started doing home delivery service until that time you you would go to the post office and pick up your mail so um so you'll find that that a lot of things just say you know uh you know like you know fran smith belmore you know okay and so the, right. obviously the post office knew who she was that they could figure right. that out so, yeah um, so just talk about, um, Google searching can also bring up some of our digitized newspapers uh, and there's a, all of our newspapers that are in New York heritage are Google searchable and you will be able to get them. You'll get the actual articles, but there are other newspapers like the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, um, that you, you, it's, it's harder to get access to. So I'm going to give you an example. So this was about, um, the spite house. Um, this was a house that was built on a property to keep uh, another developer from splitting that property. So the house is, is always said to have been built in a day, and it wasn't. It was probably framed out uh, in a day, and it kept this other developer from, from encroaching on um, another developer's property. So That's when you amazing. Do, you no, know, it's, it's wild. <laughs> um, and, and so if you do a search on this, the title, Spite House Must Come Down, the first hit you're going to get is something I wrote for our online encyclopedia. You go to that, if you go to that encyclopedia, you're going to click the link to that article. You're going to be taken directly to this article. But if you were to click on number two, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle site, you're going to be taken to a newspaper paywall. And this is because it, it's, and it's very, very frustrating. And people think that they know how to purchase the article. Newspapers.com is a, is a vendor that will digitize your newspapers for free but there's really nothing free in this world. And so what's gonna happen is your newspapers are gonna go into their database and the Google searchable hits, and that's why a lot of people search, the Google searchable hits are gonna direct you to that paywall. So if, but what we can tell you, and you can see here, um, these are the subscriptions. So it's not a, a, an, a, an inexpensive thing to join. Um, I do have access to newspapers.com. So again, if there's something you're looking for, contact Martha if you're from Belmore. <laughs> She'll come and I'll, I'll get it for you. Um, I'll, hook you I'll hook you up. Um, but you have to think kind of um, about who would have had these original newspapers. Like, so who would have, if I was the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, where would I be? Where would my microphone, microphone collection be? Well, it's at the Brooklyn Public Library. Yeah. And if you go through the Brooklyn Public Library's website, and I have the URL there directly to the newspapers, you do not have to pay a cent for it. They, they can offer this to their patrons for free. Okay. So sometimes you have to, you got to think creatively on this one. Right. And so then again, if you have, I mean, anybody can access this, but you know, this is, this is why it's such an advantage to be connected with the Brooklyn, the New York and the Queens public libraries. Right. All think about that. They're tremendous resources. Right. Right. And the same thing is said. So, so that we have the Brooklyn public library. Um, and we can also go to the Brooklyn Historical Society. And this is a really cool location to be familiar with because at one time it was known as the Long Island Historical Society. Mm -hmm. So they do have a lot of information that pertains to us here on Long Island. And they actually have newspapers going back. I think there's one newspaper like the Long Island Farmer or something. It goes back to like 1809. So you wow. can really get a lot of um, information about this area from very, very old newspapers. So then there's um, historicmapworks.com, which is really neat. And um, you can search for your town or whatever section of uh, the area you're looking for. And they have over 1.6 million searchable images in their collection. Now, when you bring it up, you will see that it is watermarked. So if you think you're, you know, you're being clever and you're going to do save image, it's going to have a watermark running through it. But you can purchase the digital image and they're not that pricey. So if you're doing a project or, um, you know, who knows, you, you want to make a wall dedicated to your street or your area, it's worth uh, buying. And I think you can buy the digital. Do they also send you? They, they, we can buy a digital copy of it. 
and you can you can actually get a physical copy and a they send you a copy yeah, right. you get a physical copy and they send it on some really nice um a uh, very hard like um you have the option to get it on a nice thick paper like parchmenty yeah right so, so it's suitable for framing so right exactly so if you you know if you're that if you're of that bent this is a really really nice resource but of course you can look all you want for free and sometimes it's just good for informational purposes so correct yeah so in a pinch it, it's a it's a good thing right um another place to look for historic maps is the archives at queen's uh public library and they have a pretty uh extensive collection of long island maps especially as i mentioned we were part of queen's county so which makes sense so here they have a bunch of um long island maps going back to 1666 wow. and they also have um you can see here they have stuff by town so we there are a lot of maps um that are for for this area again i would call make an appointment um and it's in a, it's a special room you go there they send you to a certain elevator and there is somebody there waiting for you um and yeah they're, but they're they're awesome they just have a lot of really great stuff so a plug for them is there a cavity search involved it sounds there like no there is not but but you know they will sit you at a table and they're watching you they they're not yeah they're not there's cameras everywhere and that is because and we know this like from our own collection right you know some of this stuff is really valuable and you don't want somebody like tearing out pictures or, or doing stuff like that and they don't even want you to have bags on the table you know and you just and, and just just they won't even let you photocopy stuff you have to have them do it for you so right. you know it's just their rules and um and they're they're just they're they're making sure that material will last generation after generation right one of the other really really cool things that uh new york public library has is a product called map warper and um this is a really really expensive thing that they got and hopefully someday um we'll all have it but the problem with old maps is that the orientation tends to be off on them and and the scale isn't is, isn't right so sometimes it's hard to figure out where things are located and what map warper does is take these old maps they change the orientation and they change the scale so it matches a google map so they can lay the old map over a Google map so you can see where that street um, it, what is today or that property. So it kind of gives you some perspective. And I know one of the early projects they did was they did a lot of European maps. And they said they did it because they had so many genealogy questions. And as you know, the boundaries of all these countries in Europe have, have shifted over the years. So you're, you know, you're, um, your grandfather might have come here and his passport said he was Russian, but that really is part of Poland today. So, yeah. so, so it really helps you try to figure out where where the boundaries were. Try and find Yugoslavia. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so we at Freeport have a lot of the the old maps, and and my one of my favorite is um, the Atlas of Long Island, and which we affectionately refer to as a beers map. And I don't know this to be true, but I am told that we're probably one of the last libraries that has an actual intact beers map. A wow. lot of these map atlases got stolen because the prints sell, the, the, the different plates sell for a lot of money. Um, so I do have it. And one of the things I have done um, is I've digitized it. So I'm making this all available for free on our, on our website. So I, so I feel free. Um, and, and we just have the other, other one locked up. Um, and what is really cool about these maps is they, they show you who lived on these pieces of property and they also show you some other features like that pond and if you're familiar with freeport that pond is where the rec center is and in a previous presentation i told people if there's ever a hurricane or a high tide warning do not park your car in the parking lot of the rec center because it's on an old pond and water has a tendency of coming back to where it was you'll also notice on this map that you can see the center of the, the sort of the Freeport was really centered around Main Street. And so that's where that was where it was mostly densely populated. There are also two cemeteries on this map. And when I go to the a 1906 map, those there's one cemetery. And as I mentioned before, that cemetery, uh, the Smith Cemetery, of, got moved when the property was developed. And that cemetery at the top, which is Presbyterian Cemetery. It's not really a Presbyterian cemetery. It was the Freeport Cemetery that got moved uh, about 1920, and they built the the first Freeport High School there. And today it is the playground for the middle school. Wow. So this is another. Um, this is 
this is a, a Atlas of Long Island by E. Belcher High. And this is 1914. And what I love about this map is there's a big red line going through uh, what we know as, as Woodcleft. You probably know it better is, is the home of the nautical mile. And the line basically shows that the, anything below that red line is not the village of Freeport. It's in the unincorporated section of Freeport. And it sometimes makes us very difficult for us to search uh, any residents or any structures below there because it wasn't part of Freeport. So none of these, these people living there or, or these businesses show up in any of our old directories. Um, but later on, it does, it does become part of Freeport. Um, I mentioned before about not parking um, at the rec center parking lot. Um, there are certain areas of Freeport that I have had people come to me who have said to me, I don't understand why my basement flooded. I don't know why in Hurricane Sandy, you know, um, my house was really damaged. I don't ne live near the water. And I have to correct them and say, no, you live on the water uh, because your house is built on an old lake. And, <laughs> and this was the Crystal Lake. And you can see it there. It was quite, I think it was, it was like five acres. It was quite a big lake. And today it's residential development. But the water is really still there. A few years back when they were repaving Guy Lombardo Avenue, the, the developer, I mean, the, the construction guy could not believe how much water he was finding along this road. And it was because there's an old stream there. So mm. sometimes that, that comes back to haunt you. Another question I got was from a really nice patron who had just went to the buildings department in the village of Freeport. And he was told by um, a buildings department employee that he had a garage on his property. And that was news to, to the homeowner because he had lived in that house for 40 years and never had a garage. He wanted one, but he doesn't have one. So he asked me, is there a way to find out if, the garage, if there was ever a garage on his property? So using my Nassau property, um, you can find information about a home. And it usually will tell you the date a house was built. So that was the first place I went. I wanted an idea of what maps I needed to look at. So going to my national property, I found the address and it said that the home was built in 1910. Just a little word of advice. If you're using my national property, think of that date as a circa because mm -hmm. the dates are sometimes wrong. So just think it, to give it a sort of a time frame. So, we, so according to my national property, the house is built 1908. So the first map I had after that is 1910. And there is the patron's house, no garage, okay? But then in 1917, there is something there. I can't, you know, there's a little structure there. 1928, there's a, there's a structure there. But as you can see, it is now moved. Mm -hmm. Not place. Mm -hmm. By 1935, and this is a tax map we have for the village report, is that structure is now in a different location. So I explained to the gentleman, whatever was on your property was not permanent. It actually seemed to migrate through your backyard. And I don't think a garage is, would be moving around. So, um, so he was very, very thankful for that. Um, one, of the, one of the wonderful gifts we have at, um, at the Freeport Historic Society are these old village tax maps. Um, the village historian and I saved these from the dumpster. Um, as a new administration came in, they were going to get thrown out because people are like, they're not relevant anymore, right? We're not using them. But as, as an archivist, they're perfect because they do tell you who lived in certain houses. And the great thing about these tax maps is somebody between 1915 and 1924, before the 25 came out, they went in and in red pen made updates and changes to the map. So we could sort of almost see the changes in Freeport in real time. Uh, that somebody was was creating. Wow. So this is these are maps of the hamlet of Belmore, and and the weird thing about Belmore is that it, the Freeport, you know, the incorporated village of Freeport, and there is a layer of government in Freeport. So they have a town hall and these records. Belmore is just part of the town of Hempstead. That's it. So we really don't have a local repository for these treasures. Um, but we're also, we use the same, we use the Beers maps and the Belcher Hyde atlases. And actually, uh, I just wanted to once again talk about the collegiality. I did not have a digital image <clears throat> that was good of, uh, actually, I, had, I didn't have an intact page. I have one that's terribly torn from the um, 
Belcher Hyde map of 1906. So I called up my buddy Regina over at the Freeport Library and she was able to send me a beautiful digital copy so that I could, um, and it's now part of my digital collection and I can include it in presentations. So um, again, just a shout out, librarians do like to work together and um, we, will, we will go wherever we have to go to try and we'll do our best to get you the information that you need. We do our best. And I, I have to give a shout out to the guys down at our, our Department of Public Works. They have a big drum scanner. And though it's not ideal to run a map through it, sometimes it's the only thing we have. And so they were able to get a lot of these maps digitized. And now um, we do have an overhead planetary scanner that we have been scanning stuff with. And everything I scan, I do put online. So the, everything is, I'm trying to make things as accessible as possible. Right, right. So librarians are terriers, hoarders, and notoriously cheap. So if it's free, it's for me. And um, this is a gorgeous map of Freeport, Merrick, Belmore, Wontaw, and Massapequa from a 1914 Belcher Hyde Atlas. Uh, and this is part of the digital map collection available through the New York Public Library. Now, what's amazing is now, now why on earth would I choose this map to look at Belmore, right? Because it's covering so much. Take a look, they're vector files. So no matter how close up you get, if you go to the next um, image, yeah, I can blow this up and, and the um, clarity, the resolution isn't affected at all. So take a look, see the railroad tracks. Do you see this little yellow um, Clarendon Street right in the middle? That's where the Belmore Memorial Library stands. So this is a teeny, teeny, tiny piece of that, um, of that map. And because it is a vector image and the New York Public Library has done such a fantastic job um, it's extraordinarily, it's extraordinarily useful. Um, so this is a wonderful resource, New York Public Library. Yes, and oh, well, actually, um, we have, uh, somebody donated 1914 atlas, this atlas, to the Freeport Historical Society. And with our, with our new planetary scanner that was generously donated to us with monies from Senator Brooks' office, we have been um, digitizing a lot of things, and we do, we have digitized an entire atlas. I don't know if we have vector files, but um, we are we are making all this stuff available to, to the to the public for research purposes. You know, and what we haven't really pointed out, I mean we've mentioned it, but um, you know, the, the fact that you can see, for example, Regina asked me before, this is Frederick Park, apparently part of Belmore back in 1914. It is no longer referred to that way, Belmore Villas. Um, but we also haven't mentioned that it was common practice to put the landowner's name. And that is so helpful when you're trying to reconstruct a family's history or the development of an area. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we found, one of the interesting things, Freeport had a lot of vaudevillians living here. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting that a lot of the properties were in the wives' names. And I always, I, I don't uh -huh. know why, but it was always, it was always in the wives' names, or a lot of them were. Um, so, an, we mentioned that um, um, that you know, we sometimes get calls from from uh, geologists, and they want to know what was on the property prior. And um, they, it's usually because they need to know if they need to do some sort of environmental cleanup or or whatever. So I got a call about this this property at 215 West Merrick Road, which was uh, the Fulton Savings Banks. Most people re refer to it as the uh, Round Bank. Today it is a um, a Taco Bell waiting to open oh. and the developer they were they were, they were buying the property and they wanted to know like what else had been on that property and using um, maps which um, I, I could see that there was um, nothing on that property in 1930 and then by 1955 using a, uh, a newsletter that was uh, written uh, and published by the village of Freeport that that whole area did not get zoned commercial until 1955. And so the first known use of that land was this bank in 1962. And just a little side note here, when the bank opened, you got a 4% interest rate. Um, so, so the bank was torn down and a, and a fast food restaurant was put there, but I probably saved them some money 
um, cause they didn't have to start doing soil samples because there wasn't like a munitions depot there or a dry cleaner or, or tannery. <laughs> um, and, and there's a, we have a fascinating book at, at the, the library, uh, at our library. Uh, it's called, um, the history of Nassau County, uh, community place names. And it's so interesting how no one knows like how, how sometimes their community got named. And one of my favorites is Roosevelt. Roosevelt was actually known as Rum Point. And it was because it was named that way because it was on the um, stagecoach line, and there was there was a lot of taverns there. And at the time, the taverns were also hotels, so it had a reputation of having a lot of liquor. So we have no idea why Belmore is called Belmore. It was originally known as Little Neck, and then it was known as New Bridge. And North Belmore was known as Smithville South until 1920. And then uh, we became Belmore um, proper with the uh, advent of the post office. And so this young lady was featured in a Newsday article. Uh, she has been doing a ton of research since she was a really young girl. So she's about 15, I think, here in this picture. And she is the youngest member uh, that comes to our local history meetings and informational uh, presentations. And she's hell bent on finding out why Belmore is called Belmore. Um, she is, has not given up. She was literally reading through thousands of pages of um, newspapers. And then when we digitized, the Belmore paper, it like opened up a whole world for her. So she really feels she is connected. There was a Lord Belmore, but with one L um, who lived in England. And apparently she thinks that there is some connection between Lord Belmore and our town. Um, I fully expect her to figure this out. But anyway, it's kind of interesting how meaningful this is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, 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 it is fascinating, and you may never really uncover things, but what we, what we find is um, we can maybe get kind of close to, like, this is the probability, the probability is this is why, you know, and that, that's always we have all kinds of urban legends, like, wait, there, there's a legend that when the railroad would come through, the conductor's girlfriend lived here, and so he would ring the bell more for her. I mean, it's so heavy-handed, but that's that's what a lot of people think so i know i know so you know it is what it is but yeah no it is it is it is fun trying to figure that all out um so we're going to end with something that happened to me a few years ago and if you had seen another one of my presentations i i i uh, had gone into this but i think it, it, it is worth repeating so um as you know uh martha and i are reference librarians and and we have a lot of interesting people that come through our facilities Oh yeah, uh, and I remember just just when we got went on a lockdown. I remember everyone was telling me you need to watch the Tiger King because you'll never believe these people. And I just looked at that whole that whole cast of characters and thought that's like Tuesday of me on the reference desk during a full moon, <laughs> right? I mean, all right. So you got Joe Exotic. I had a member of the Starfleet Academy ask me a question once. Mm -hmm. but, you know, so yeah, I'm not really I'm not really surprised. So. One day, a woman comes into the library and she's telling me that she's got a speakeasy in her basement. And I just smile because I'm not going to like go there. Like, okay, really? And so she's insisting that I come to her house and see it. And I'm like, um, hmm, I should go with a complete stranger to her house in Northeast Freeport and then go down to her basement because nothing bad could happen there. So she's very, very insistent. So I... I, I bring some reserves. I bring the director of the library and Cynthia Krieg, our village historian, to this woman's house. And the story is, is that her aunt bought the house um, in, I think, the 1960s and had lived there until her death. And her nieces inherited the house. And they were selling the house that, and it needed some rent out. It needed to, some upgrades. So they had a lot of workmen come in. And one of the workmen was like, uh, ladies, there's something behind this wall. <laughs> and they're like, no, 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 there's nothing there. And he goes, no, this, this closet, it doesn't make any sense. And he found like this like trigger and he pops it and I, it all opens up. The whole wall swung out and in it is a full on bar. And we found newspaper clippings in there 
that were about 1937. So we don't think the bar had ever had, it was closed off once the owner had died and nobody afterwards ever knew it existed. And you walk through it and it was, had been beautiful, beautifully appointed. It actually, these, these tile floors with, it said, um, you know, FZPAO, which we believe was the homeowner, Frederick Zimer, proprietor and owner. Uh -huh. uh, this part of Freeport was, was part of Roosevelt during Prohibition, from, and Prohibition was from 1920 to 1933. Um, and these are the bands for the Roosevelt um, uh, Fire Department. And so he, he was a member of the Fire Department. And then you can see there are all these liquor bottles with, with liquor in them. The back is full of bottles. Oh, that's incredible. That's crazy, absolutely crazy. And we, we were able to get the still. They donated the still to the Freeport Historical Society, a beautiful copper still. And over here is uh, where they would have filled the, 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 um, the bottles and there would have been a bucket there. So, as, so nothing would have been wasted. So this concludes um, our, our program. And, um, and I just wanted to go, we just want to share some resources with you. So again, here, are the, here, here is the free newspaper access and uh, free access to our digital uh, photos. And um, I also have put together a local history guide. Um, it's predominantly for Freeport, but I do, as I mentioned, I have a lot of maps from different communities that I have loaded. Definitely up. found. I've definitely found resources and, and information on other areas. No question. Yeah, yeah. And so these are these are all the free sources. And what I would suggest you guys do is, if you're doing any research, if you don't find anything right away, come back in a few months because things just keep getting loaded and loaded. Um, Martha put together a, a house history resource page, um, and I have it here. This is the URL that will take you to that uh, that handout. Um, so. Uh, it, it includes all the, the URLs and right, everything we discussed. Exactly. And, and just so you know, um, this program and other history programs you can find on our, our random, um, you know, random programs you can find on our YouTube channels. And these are URLs that will take you to them. Um, so um, before we conclude, I just like, Martha, do you have any like, um, oh, let me just say this. Here's our contact information. All right. Oh, yes. Okay. So if you um, contact me, I will give you uh, Martha's home phone number. <laughs> and you definitely call her in the middle of the night because she, she's very good at that. Yeah. I love doing local history research from my bed. Yes, exactly, absolutely. Exactly. And if you contact Martha, she'll give you the password um, combination to my garage. Co feel free to come over and use my tools. Um, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, though, um, but feel free to contact us and we, we'll, we'll, definitely, um, we'll definitely try to help you do some, some of your research. Um, so before we go, Martha, do you have any shameless plugs? Anything you want shameless to plugs. Yes, uh, on our on our YouTube page, you will find we were part of the Story Corps um, at your library program, and there's a lot of really interesting oral histories that you can access, plus some very brand new staff created content. People uh, who are now quarantined at home are recording stuff right and left, and it's really surprisingly good. So please do check out our YouTube channel. Yeah. And I, I will shamelessly plug, um, I have a couple of programs up. I have one about, um, one is called Freeport Walks Into a Bar, and it's the history of bar culture in Freeport. And the other one is, I don't know much about Freeport. And coming soon, I should be doing one on uh, the history of Bennington Park, which is a community in, in Freeport. Um, it's no longer there. It was, it's now where Home Depot is. But um, it became a African-American and Italian enclave, and it has such an amazing rich history and the people that live there uh, are also proud of that community and so I, I, I can't wait to get that program uh, up and the other one I would like to do is, um, is what I have I'm, I'm just re reworking it is the Jews of Freeport which is the history of Jewish culture in Freeport and that came out of um, a program I, I had done for a local Hadassah here and uh, it, it, it's very interesting and I'm just in the process of updating it because I actually found even more information to add. So keep, keep looking out for those. And again, feel free to contact us. Thank you guys. Thanks for everything. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't know how to stop the recording.